Welcome everyone to the Philip Dacey and Leo Dangle tribute reading. Thank you very much for joining us tonight to celebrate the lives and poetry of these two beloved SMSU professors. My name is Marianne Murphy Zarzana and I teach here at SMSU and direct the creative writing program. I will now introduce Dr. Jan Loft, Dean of the College of Arts, Letters and Sciences at SMSU, who will give the welcome. Dean Loft will be retiring this May after teaching and serving in our administration. We asked her to give the welcome because she knew both Phil and Leo. We will miss Jan's leadership and vision and we're deeply grateful for her many years of supporting the fine arts here, in particular for creating the annual fine art celebration that we have every April. Tonight's event will be one of the last events of this year's abundance of wonderful fine arts events. Please give a warm welcome to Dean Jan Loft. Thank you and good evening. As Marianne said, my name is Jan Loft. And I was really honored when Marianne asked if I would do the welcome for this gathering. And as she explained, I am one of the not so many anymore folks who remembered when Phil and Leo were here on campus as members of the faculty. So I started to look back to conjure up my strongest recollections of Leo and Phil. And like it was last night, I remember the event in CH201. It was a celebration of Leo's career. Bill Holm played the piano. Ed Lauman played the mandolin. Many people read Leo's poems, and it was a great night of poetry and music. Sadly, that was back in the day when we didn't record events as we do now. But that night lives on vividly in our memories, and I'm really pleased to see that tonight's event is being recorded. Uh, but a lot of you here tonight probably remember that night in CH201. And that was one of those events where I sat there going, I am so glad I'm here. This is great. And I am surrounded by incredibly talented people. An event that was recorded and is a strong memory of mine was the night that Phil performed his poetry set to the music of his son's band in the SMSU Black Box Theater. That was another one of those nights when I thought to myself, I am really glad that I'm here. This is magical and I'm surrounded by such talented people. I couldn't have told you when that happened, but Mary Ann has a framed poster of that event out in the lobby and it was November of 1992. So it was even farther ago than I thought. In an interview from early 2014, Phil said, it's easy to forget, given the star quality of so many poets, that only a small percentage of them will be read by posterity. Yeats, when asked to comment on his poet contemporary, said, one thing is certain, there are too many of us. <laughs> Phil went on to say, the many disappear and the few remain. My way of dealing with that fact is to be grateful for the life that poetry has given me, a life I couldn't have predicted when I was young. Leo Dangle was noted for his sharp eye and his ear for the small talk of the small town. Bill Holm once said that Leo found the language of poetry where almost no one else thinks to look or listen. Cold barns, fields, the noises of pigs and cows, the longings of awkward boys, and the secret passions of old farm women. It has been said that Leo's work is easy to read and hard to forget. Tonight we celebrate the lives and poetry of two men. We will travel from New York City to the rural landscapes of South Dakota with our tour guides, Phil and Leo. Thank you very much, Jan. And just to give you a little teaser, Jan brought a prop to go with her poem. So just, just be ready for this, people. She always goes the extra mile. Next, I would like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the evening, Larry Gavin. 
Larry is an SMSU literature, creative writing, and then education major who teaches high school English and writing in Faribault, Minnesota. Larry writes and publishes poetry, and he is also an accomplished fisherman. Born in Austin along the Iowa border, Gavin knew early he would be a writer. Not just any writer, but a poet. We're glad he did. Please give a warm welcome to Larry Gavin. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're going to have a series of readers uh, read uh, poems, and I'm going to be the first uh, of that series. And then, of course, uh, Phil and Leo will have the last, uh, last word. I was a student of, uh, of both of these uh, gentlemen, and it was a great pleasure. Uh, and so because of that, I'm going to read a poem by Philip Dacey called The Buzz, which is a, which is a, sc a school poem. The Buzz. I watch the clock, but when it's time to start the class, I hesitate. I've fallen in love again with the hum of voices, students deep in chat. On the shore of their heedless ocean, low roar of easy teetes, free from my bell-like, let's begin. I fake fuss with a stack of notes. Weeks ago, at the start of the term, they sat, mostly strangers, silent, but now they formed a kind of team, veterans of the poetry front. Or else, poetry is what they are, their voices anyway, beyond translation, sense no more than blur, words in the service of pure sound. Now it's one minute, now it's two past the hour, and still I can't bear to throttle this community. How long can I dumbly stand here? Some students start watching me, watching them talk and wonder what's up. They know I take my job seriously, that as teacher I play for keeps. But what I want to keep is them. They're insouciants like Whitman's animals. Here's to the view from the podium when duty demures break the spell. I could tell them what I've seen, heard, or take role, talk assignments, due dates. Instead, I start to read out loud as someone sitting by himself might, near sotto voce, underground stream, feeding into their general stir. Had we but world enough and time, they quiet to catch what's on the air. And um, I'm gonna read a poem by Leo, uh, it's, it's carp time right now. If, if you have an interest in carp, uh, all the drainage ditches and all the culverts, they're stacked up trying to do what carp do, which is overcome obstacles. Um, and this is a particularly great uh, a carp poem um, for, a, for a lot of reasons. It's called Old Man Bruner Spearing Carp on Wolf Creek. Early spring rushing water, he is out there below the bridge at a narrow channel poised with a pitchfork. He spears, pitches huge carp onto the bank where they flop and buckle until dust cakes on their green scales. Old man Bruner will drive around to neighbors giving away carp from a wet gunny sack. This is old man Bruner's gift, the flesh of the carp his way of almost giving himself. And there are still those who accept. <laughs> so. I'm Susan McLean. I was a colleague of both Phil Dacey and Leo Dangle. I've been here now at SMSU for 29 years. And I'll start with a poem by Leo Dangle. One of the things that I admired most about Leo is that when he wrote poems, they were poems that anybody could understand. Even people who think they don't like poetry would get what Leo was saying. And this is from his very last chapbook before he died, when threshing ended. It's called Coming Back. 
I wonder how much I missed by staying close to home. I've spent my life in South Dakota, Kansas, Minnesota, and now, in retirement, South Dakota again. I've been out of the United States only twice. Well, three times if you count Washington, D.C. <laughs> when I still lived and worked in Minnesota, my father bought me a plot in the cemetery at Idlewild, our country parish, a mile from the farm where I grew up. He never spoke of this to me. Buying the plot was his way of looking after me. And the space will be luxurious for my ashes in a jar, which would fit in a deep post hole, but will have a virtual homestead beside my family and our ancestors who settled on the tall grass prairie. It now seems a short time ago. I might as well embrace my local life. There's nowhere else I have to be. My next poem was written soon after I heard that Leo had died. It's called Call Waiting for Leo Dangle, 1941 to 2016. When Leanne phoned to tell me you were dead, I heard the beep, but didn't take the call, deep in another. You'd have understood. Your partner, Patience, was dependable and steadfast as a hound. It came after the crash, when you were paralyzed at 20. You were an ordinary guy, funny but shy. And now you've crystallized into a poet. Now what? You've become words on a page that murmur in my ear in your dry, deadpan voice. And slowly I'm comforted that Though absent, you're still here, waiting in your true life. I've only read about the one you lived inside your head. Phil Dacey is the reason that I started writing poetry again after a 19-year hiatus. I gave it up when I graduated from high school, and he encouraged me to start again. Um, one of the things that was unusual about Phil was that when he's writing about things that sound like his real life, he often is making things up. So you never know whether something he writes about really happened or he's just chosen to pretend that it happened. So with this one, I strongly suspect that it didn't really happen, but I'll never know for sure. I know that he used to jog around Lake Calhoun when he lived up in Minneapolis, and this seems to have been inspired by that. It's called The Lifeguard. Gray day, the water all ice, no swimmers there. The beach deserted as I come running by, but someone's sitting in the lifeguard chair. I do a double take, slow down and stare, He's a still, dark silhouette against the sky. Cold gray day, the water's ice, no swimmers anywhere. Although the hand of someone gasping for air is not about to wave and catch his eye, there's someone sitting in the lifeguard chair. The prince of ice, lord of the land of despair. Or off season, someone missing work his perch on high, now that the snow's back, no swimmers anywhere. Or maybe it's himself he'd save, aware of ways men drown that aren't so watery. And so he's come to try the lifeguard's chair. And now I think I know him, as in a mirror, alone and distant, at a remove. So said I. Cold gray day, the water's ice, no swimmers there, though someone's sitting in the lifeguard chair. 
reading that poem made me think back to my first job. And so I wrote this poem about him. It's called From the Chair. For Philip Dacey, 1939 to 2016. At my first job, I sat on high all day, trusted with guarding lives, yet at a cost, vigilance, sunburn, boredom, meager pay. I rescued no one, but no lives were lost. At my last job, I sit alone indoors, pallid with chronic aches, no pay, no clout, seeing the afters follow the, the befores. All lives are lost. I watch and write it out. Hi, my name is Jim, whoa, that's loud, <laughs> Jim Wool. My name is Jim Tate, I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing here at SMSU. Um, I uh, probably knew Phil uh, better than I did Leo. Um, uh, they were both gentlemen who I think were emblematic of the talent that uh, has existed in the English department here for 49 years. Um, Last time I read poetry in this type of forum, I was a student at Huron College, which is now a water park. <laughs> and several of us read at Yankton College, uh, which is now a minimum security prison. So, <laughs> so I'm just saying. Uh, so <laughs> um, when I was a young boy, I had a uh, this first poem I'm reading is, is by uh, Leo, and it's uh, entitled Farming in a Lilac Shirt. Uh, when I was a young boy, I had a, I had a purple shirt, and uh, I wore it on my first date, February 12th, 1972. It was uh, um, Valentine's Day dance, junior high, Emmitsburg, Iowa. And uh, my date that evening was a young Irish woman, uh, Mary Murray, who is my wife. And uh, puffy sleeves, pirate sleeves, you know. <laughs> it was really something. Yes. <laughs> uh, but Leo, uh, Farming in a Lilac Shirt by Leo Dangle. I opened the Sears catalog it was hard to decide. Dress shirts were all white the last time I bought one for Emma's funeral. I picked out a color called plum, but when the shirt arrived, it seemed more the color of lilacs. Still, it was beautiful. No one I knew had a shirt like this. After chores one Sunday, I dressed for church. Suddenly, the, church, the, the shirt seemed to be a sissy color and I held it up near the window. In the sun, the lilac looked more lilac, more lovely. But could a man wear a shirt that color? Someone might say, that's quite the shirt. <laughs> I wore the old shirt to church. And every Saturday night, I thought, tomorrow, I'll wear the shirt. Such a sh sad and terrible waste to spend good money on a shirt, a shirt I even liked, and then not being able to wear it. I wore the shirt once on a cold day, and I kept my coat buttoned. <laughs> In the spring, I began wearing the shirt for every day when I was sure no one would stop by. I wore the shirt when I milked the cows and in the field when I planted oats. It fit perfectly. As I steered the John Deere, I looked over my shoulder and saw lilac against the blue sky, filled with white seagulls following the tractor, and not once did I wipe my nose on my sleeve. <laughs> I 
the uh, the last time I talked to Phil Dacey um, was an uh, interview I did with him for um, um, just went before his appearance at Marshall Festival 15. Um, our uh, office had decided that we wanted to do a cover story on Phil. Um, we knew he was coming up and uh, so Mary Ann was very gracious in helping to uh, arrange that uh, 11th hour interview. I met him over here at the Quality Inn and um, he was, um, he, we walked in pretty much at the same time. He hadn't even checked in. I asked for 20 minutes and he gave me 45 minutes. And that's just the type of gentleman and gentleman that, that Phil was. And uh, I asked him what he'd be reading and he, and he said he'd be doing uh, several humorous poems that evening and you'll have an opportunity here at the end of the evening to, to taste a, a part of that. Uh, uh, it was just a magical um, reading and just true performance art. Um, but this uh, Phil Dacey poem kind of reminds me of that evening. It's entitled Doozy. Is it spelled Doozy or E-Y? or IE from a letter. It's doozy in the dictionary and doozy in my heart and doozy up and down the street. It's doozy where the daisies roam and dizzy where the lovers doze and days are lazy. It's doozy where it's daisy and acy doozy, upsy daisy, dipsy doodle when it's crazy but doozy all the time. It's doozy any way you spell it but dicey if you try to sell it Doozy, any way you slice it, with doozy you don't have to spice it up. So doozy this and doozy that and keep your doozy hot and let your doozy out when it wants out. For hunky-dory, entrobe at all terry day, makes a fellow woozy, onesie twosie, does he does she, yes they doozy. To the tune of Tommy Dorsey, William Basie, any bluesy band. Then tell your Susie, there's no time for choosy, and it's all good newsy. Till the boozy, blowsy, easy, jazzy, doozy, end. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Blair, and I'm, uh, I'm listed as a professor here on the list everyone got, but I actually retired last May, so I'm uh, a professor emeritus now. But happy to be back and to see so many familiar faces. I, um, I'm gonna, the first poem I'm going to read is by Leo Dango, and he and I had offices right next to each other. Neither one of us was a big talker, though, so the way we would get together would be to borrow books from each other and then chat after we borrowed the books. So Leo and I were often popping back and forth at each other's offices for our little book chats. Um, so I'm going to read a poem by Leo, and uh, one of the reasons I chose it was because it's the poem for the cover of the book, and also because I love crows, and Leo is um, exposing an interest in the wildness of crows in this poem. Not the usual at McDonald's. I'm exiting the drive through holding a cup of coffee when the sharp caw of a crow near my open window startles me and I slop hot coffee into my lap. My anger flashes at the crow and I think of the woman who held her coffee cup between her thighs and sued because she was burned. I try to imagine how McDonald's might be held responsible for failing to warn customers about such startling noises but I'm not really burned. And I notice that the crow, now sitting with lifted wings on the golden arches sign, looks like a dark angel who brought a wake-up call. That sudden, wild note I took as just some animal prank was a challenge, too, and I feel pleasantly alert. 
um, Bill Dacey was a, a really good friend, and we also had sort of a, a little odd way of getting together. We had breakfast about once a month, and we talked about our students. Yes, we do that. We talk about our students. And the other thing we often talked about was pedagogy, how to teach and reach our students. And we're so busy already teaching that I don't think we have enough discussions about that. But Phil and I would indulge in that. And we would meet. We both always cho chose to teach the earliest possible class in the morning. So I was teaching an 8 o'clock class for a while. And he always picked an early class. So we'd meet before our early classes and have breakfast and talk about students and teaching. And uh, so that was a, a nice way we connected. And I also um, enjoyed his wry humor and his uh, passion about a lot of things. He, um, he, shared, he shared a number of things with Thomas McGrath and wrote a poem called Letter to Thomas McGrath, which I'm going to read. Um, just a little about a couple people that are mentioned in the poem uh, might be helpful for some people. He, uh, Thomas McGrath is, um, died, uh, he would have been 100 this year. But he, he died in the 90s and was born early in the century on a farm in North Dakota and went on to get uh, graduate degrees and then was actually offered, would be offered a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, which the war, World War II interrupted. So he never, he never did finish that. But he was a, an incredibly interesting poet who almost nobody knows about. People, the general reader doesn't know much about him, but he's very highly regarded by both critics and fellow poets. So uh, Phil felt very strongly towards him, and I think the reason was because Phil himself was so uh, passionate about his roots. He grew up in a working class family, and he had a lot of sympathy for people like coal miners, et cetera. And Thomas McGrath was basically a socialist who grew up in progressive times out um, in South Dakota, or North Dakota. And so um, this is for Thomas McGrath, and it mentions um, Federico Garcia Lorca, a lyric poet and playwright from Spain who was assassinated during the Civil War in Spain. And then he mentions a couple of other people you will recognize. Uh, when he quotes them, he quotes a number of other poems here, or poets here, pieces from poems. So there's three parts to this poem, and it's called Letter to Thomas McGrath. One, Robert Bly asked the dead sparrow in his hand to forgive him for all the hours spent listening to the radio. Tom, I ask you to forgive me for all the hours I did not hold your books in my hands. In 1970, I even betrayed you, charged with the task, privilege, of taking the reins of your returning crazy horse, literary magazine, and fresh out of Iowa's writing mill, I put into that stallion's feed bag the dope of mainstream careerism and dragged the madness out of him corporatized his heroic body. Mussolini, this is a quote, fascism should have been called corporatism. Forgive me for that too. You said Cal, not Lowell, oh not Lowell, the farmhand led you to the light, but you were too young to enter. Whenever our paths crossed in Minnesota, I was too young, culpably so, to enter your light. How I miss the conversations we didn't have. I would have told you of my Irish grandfathers, the one killed young by his coal mine work in southern Illinois in 1900, the other at the same time excoriating in verse the English in New York's Irish Times. You, a master cursor, boiler of language, over the flame of anger till the pot jumps off the stove to scalding syllables flying in all directions. And believer with Muhammad Deeb that nothing is more a sacrament than a curse would have cursed all oppressors everywhere. 
and I would have asked about your working on the docks in Manhattan's Chelsea district the year I was born. I went there yesterday to look for your ghost studying the cries of flying gulls, but found only the Chelsea Piers, a sports and entertainment mall. You would not be surprised, you who no less than Lorca breathed fire on New York. He there 10 years before you. I want your ghosts to meet on a bench in Washington Square Park and passers-by to see tiny flames flake where your words dart back and forth between you, neither Spanish nor English, but the language of healing fire. Two, when you sing in high gear your extreme word-mongering and verbal foliation, a form of high blarney, an oral book of Kells, the wind listens and takes notes, reshapes itself to blow with greater color. Your six-gun tongue comes, came riding out of the West, the pain of history's loss translated into a blazing barrel an arsenal of waves in the ear. You were Joycean on a threshing machine, harvesting words at the juncture of dream and reality. Your Irish gab twisted and turned in the prison of the barbed word world, left elaborate patterns of sound like star charts on the air. Three. More than 30 years after the war killed your brother, you were unable to read Blues for Jimmy in public. You always wrote out of streaming open wounds like multiple mouths. And the wars continue. Once again, we must steam the blood from the dollar bills. I know your heart burst deep inside the earth when Paul Wellstone's plane went down and your love for Tomasito still makes waves crash against the shore. You promised, I'll take you, my darlings, over the river if you open your eyes and slip your foot out of the stone. It's clear to all of us now, you are the Dakotas Whitman, the pair of you, hand in hand, leading us forward on the open road. Thank you. Good evening. I can move that back. It's a pretty hot mic. Uh, my name is Mark Foken, and I teach in the Communication Studies program here at Southwest. I've taught in that program since the fall of 1995. And unlike, I think, many of the readers this evening, I only knew Leo and Phil uh, as sort of casual acquaintances. Uh, I'd met them a few times. Uh, I expressed my appreciation for their poetry, but I didn't really get to know them. Um, and I probably should correct that, uh, except I did get to know them through their poetry. Uh, I feel like I knew them. Uh, I also, over the past 21 years, served as the director of forensics, which is the speech and debate team um, here at Southwest. Uh, position I held until last year when I stepped down. And if you know anything about speech and debate, <clears throat> excuse me, you know that uh, you're always looking for material uh, and you're always looking for uh, a piece or a program that students can perform. And poetry interpretation is one of the categories that certainly uh, individuals can, can choose to compete in. And so uh, I, I found myself starting at Southwest at a very, very rich place uh, for content and material. And so I turned frequently to local authors and authors from our own creative writing program uh, for that. The first poem that I want to read is uh, one of Phil Dacey's poems. It's called Walt Whitman's Answering Service. And I remember this poem and uh, working with a student about unpacking this poem and what it meant to him uh, what it meant to me, and uh, we, we, we wove this poem into, it was er, my early years here at Southwest, we wove it into a program of poetry about how technology um, is starting to uh, uh, um, uh, lead us to sort of disconnect with each other, um, and, uh, and so it's always sort of held a special place for me. Walt, Walt Whitman's Answering Service. Who calls here? 
hankering, gross, mystical, nude. Did you expect to find me home? Then you do not know me. I am never at home. I'm always on the road. All roads lead to the telephone. Wherever you go, on or off the road, a telephone wire sings beside you. I knew you would call. Everyone does, in his or her own way. All the wrong numbers you dial are meant for me, are attempts of your better self to make the call you are afraid to make. If you would have me know who you are, leave no name or number, simply give to this line the mist of your breath, and I will recognize you. I will call you back, unless you wait by the phone for me to call you back. Be confident, but be warned. My voice could be disguised as anything. Anything. If you love me, if you truly wish to get through to me, you will hang up at the sound of the tone and dial your own number. If the line is busy or no one answers, consider yourself lucky. You can always call again. If the line is out of order, remember, you are the only repairman. If the line has been disconnected, remember, you are the only telephone company. The second poem I'm going to read is uh, one of Leo Dangle's poems, and I have to confess that the first poem I chose, I was late in choosing, um, was, was taken by my good friend Marcy Olson. <clears throat> so when Marcy reads her poem, you'll see me over uh, on the south side of the room getting mystical and squinting my eyes up looking at animals. Hmm? <laughs> and grading her, right? No, I'm not going to be doing that. Um, no, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be far away. I'll be back on the farm um, in western Yellow Medicine County, which, again, is a reason why uh, I have a special place in my heart for Leo Dangle, uh, because when I first started reading his poetry, it spoke to me in a way that uh, made me rediscover my youth, uh, because uh, I, I can imagine, like Leo, um, I, I saw the world in much the same way he did. Uh, the poem I've chosen to read, uh, though, because <clears throat> my first one was taken, is um, one of Old Man Brunner poems. And I mentioned earlier that I, I, uh, I, I, I tapped into local artists and these local poets, Phil and Leo, quite often when we were looking for a piece of poetry that fit um, a poetry program. And I have to confess that when I, uh, I was uh, working with students, uh, oftentimes uh, first generation, especially male students who were on the forensics team, didn't have a great appreciation for poetry until I handed them some of Leo's poetry. And then they go, oh, well, that's fun. Um, and they identified with it. And, um, and so this too comes from a poet, uh, well, actually it was used in a couple of programs of poetry. Uh, but the old man Brunner poems have always been sort of fun for me. This one is entitled, Old Man Brunner Nails Jesus to the Cross for Wendell and Bernice. It started when Bernice found an old crucifix in the junk room, except there was no cross, only a bronze Jesus with the nails still through the hands. And Bernice asked Old Man Brunner to make another cross. So two nights later, Old Man Brunner showed up to our place with the cross ready for the Jesus. And old man Bruner did a fine job, I got to admit, with some solid oak, some real hard stuff from a chair leg. And I told him he'd better drill some holes first or he'd never get those little nails pounded into that hard wood. But he wouldn't listen and spent 20 minutes nailing the Jesus to that cross. And you know how religious Bernice always was. And I could tell it was starting to bother her with old man Brunner hammering on the kitchen table, and the nails kept bending over until they all broke off. So Bernice said, let Wendell do it. But it didn't seem like something I wanted any part of. <laughs> and then old man Brunner was going to use some shingle nails he had in his pocket. But Bernice wouldn't hear of that, said it wouldn't look right. So I found some tiny brass screws, but Bernice said, those wouldn't look right either, and they didn't even have screws back in those days. <laughs> and old man Bruner made a joke that I really don't remember exactly, but it got Bernice really mad. <laughs> but old man Bruner finally put the Jesus on the cross and used the brass screws anyway. 
But afterwards, he took a file and flattened out the screw heads so you couldn't tell them from nails. Thanks. Tall person put it up, I have to put it down. Hi, I'm Pat Brace, and I'm the chair of the Fine Arts and Communication Studies program, and I'm a professor of art. And I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up on the side of a mountain. So when I moved to Minnesota, it was a bit of an adjustment. We actually had something called Minnesota 101 that was part of the Bush grants. And part of that was going on tour of Southwest Minnesota with Bill Holm. And he took us to all the fun places, and it was flat. And he cultivated what he called the prairie eye, which we've all heard of. And one of the things that he recommended that we do was read the local poets. And through that, I discovered the works of Leo and Phil. And then a little later, we did the program that Jan alluded to earlier, the tribute to Leo. And I was asked to read for that, and I also got to take part in the mass choir where Bill played piano while we sang songs that he had written for Leo's words. And it was one of the best times I can ever remember having with my colleagues on campus. And so I'm gonna read the poem that I read at that celebration, The Widow Leaves the Home Place from Hogs and Personals by Leo Dangle. Our life had no sudden tragedy. The kids grew up and left one by one and a slow cancer killed my husband. People remember a barn that burns down, but forget a dozen that weather away. I'm used to seeing deserted farms. I never thought ours would be one. Leaving would be easier if a new family was moving into the place. I can imagine decayed gray boards, broken windows, and tall yellow grass up to the sills but I can't bear thinking about the years of dusty silence that will settle in here. So I've decided, before I leave, I'm going to cook dinner. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes, fresh bread, peas, cucumber, strawberries and cream. I'll set the table the way I did 25 years ago. Fill the plates, pour the coffee, and then I'll go. Let whoever comes wonder. What happened here? Why did they leave so suddenly in the middle of a feast? Let the detectives search for the clues, something out of place, like a butcher knife stuck in the door, where life was always ordinary and never a sign of violence. Thank you. As I said earlier, I'm Marianne Murphy Zarzana, and I teach creative writing here. And I've used uh, Phil's and Leo's poems in many of my classes. And um, I consider Phil a dear friend. I didn't get to know Leo that well, um, but Phil was a, a very dear friend and um, very much of an inspiration to me. I came here, and at first I was the assistant tennis coach, and then I got into PR. But then midlife, I went back and got my MFA in creative writing. And he was one of the people who wrote a letter of recommendation for me and really gave me a lot of support to make that huge life transition. So I'm going to read tonight for Dana Yost, who could not be here, but I love the selections that he came up with. The first is called Saving Single Trees, and this is from one of uh, Leo's last books, and this is the title poem, Saving Single Trees. Reading the grapes of wrath during an afternoon high school study hall, I was mostly in an empty farmyard at twilight with the Jode family at the beginning of a journey. They've sold all the farm implements and gear. Needing a food supply for on the road, they're getting ready to butcher a couple of pigs. Pa says, shouldn't have sold those single trees. This talk I understood. Pleased to be an insider, I knew that a single tree, a wooden crossbar with hooks on the end for hitching a horse to a load, is also quite handy for butchering. I had seen men put the hooks of a single tree 
under the hind leg tendons of a slaughtered pig and hoist it up for scalding, gutting, and scraping the bristles off the skin. Years later, as I'm reading the novel, the familiar farm details capture me all over again. But now I'm reminded how I'm, I've lost, given up, or discarded things I'd wished too late I had kept. When my aging parents sold the farm, I should have asked them to save me a single tree. Who knows what uses I'd find for it? It might stand for all of the things I long to have back. And if I had a single tree to show off, I'd have occasions to say the word, single tree. I've always liked the sound of it. A musical hearkening back to a live tree with branches and roots. The second choice that Dana Yost made, and, and Dana Yost, um, for those of you who don't know, um, he graduated from SMSU with a degree in creative writing. He went on to become um, an award-winning writer and uh, newspaper editor here at the Marshall Independent. And he is a prolific writer. If you haven't read any of his books, please check him out. He writes poetry, essays, and he just came out with a wonderful book about Miniota in the 1940s. So his choice for uh, Phil Dacey, Philip Dacey, was Notes of an Ancient Chinese Poet. It's a beautiful little handmade book. One of the things I love about uh, Philip was that he wrote in all different genres and um, just was a master of so many different forms, sonnets, villanelles, you name it. And this is a short form, Notes of an Ancient Chinese Poet. When a new emperor comes to power, certain old poems quietly revise themselves. Shave the head of your poem, lest it like what it sees in the mirror too much. Who can write a poem about blossoms falling in the wind and mean only blossoms falling in the wind. <coughs> Listen to the voice of each dead poet as if it were yours. It is. To say your poems by heart is to know how a migratory bird feels flying home. Outside the wind, what poem can compete the one that strips away dead thoughts. Tea leaves in hot water, words steeped in silence. Snow on the mountain, flowers in the valley, one landscape. Compose the poem with icy detachment, with a simple heart. Thank you. I am shrinking <clears throat> each, uh, <clears throat> each uh, few months, right. Uh, what a privilege to be here tonight. I uh, just want to say, I'm Eileen Thomas. It says on there, Emeritus Professor. It doesn't say that I started back in 1969. Leo Dangle uh, came in 1968. I came in 1969, and Phil came in 1970. We were babies. <laughs> they never, ever hired a younger group of faculty than that group those first few years. We were very young, full of ideals, uh, and with a lot of energy. Phil and I uh, had offices up in the community of scholars, if you don't know about the community of scholars, that's one worthy of the history books. Uh, we were very close friends. Uh, Phil's kids, my kids, uh, my, my kids grew up with Leo, uh, knowing Leo, taking him to religious center to church, doing all kinds of things together. Um, Phil 
periodically would leave a little offering on my desk when I was department chair, I, probably usually after we'd had a rip-roaring fight over some administrative thing when I was chair. But uh, this was one of the poems that he left, uh, that he thought I would like, that he had written quite a few years earlier, but had just been accepted for publication. And I just want to, it's called The Last Picture. And it's, uh, it's a tribute to Leo, but it's really about all of us and the inevitable point where there will be a last picture of each of us. And the last few months of, Leo, of Phil's life, uh, my partner and I were privileged to have time off and on with Phil. And he taught us many lessons, but the one thing was never in my life have I experienced somebody who was so ready, ready spiritually, emotionally, for taking that last picture, for that last picture to happen. So uh, this is a tribute written by Phil Dacey for Leo called The Last Picture. <clears throat> this is the last picture of me standing, my friend says, pointing into the album during my visit to his apartment where everything's within easy reach for someone in a chair the center of the floor open, as if for a dance, and all I can do is nod and stare, caught in the headlights of those words, as simple as ice on a road's curve, as penetrating as the sound of metal rolling over on itself like tickets in a thunderous drum of chance. In the photo, He's a lanky 20, more than half a life ago, his legs slightly spread, taking the measure of the earth, a smile that speaks the sun at noon, though he does not look down to see himself shadow free in every direction. Simplified to black and white, Leo isn't looking anywhere that day except out at me who's been exposed, the one sitting by choice. Afterwards, I will imagine other last pictures for other lives. This is the last picture of me believing in God. This is the last picture of me making love. This is the last picture of me writing a poem. And albums will f collect and fill with last photographs, a great and drifting snow while the photographers of last pictures, those self-renunciatory saints, work in obscurity and the knowledge that a last picture never's a last picture until it's too late. For now, though, I'm still marveling at how the plainest English, quiet, matter-of-fact, a mild disturbance of sound waves between pictures of parents and sisters, farm scenes, can shrapnel through the air and make spines anywhere send a blizzard of electrical information up and down their long and living strands. I am afraid to stand up or try to. I start taking pictures in my head fast. I pose with Leo for a picture we both know is already developing. Hello, I'm Marcy Olson. Um, I work in the communications and marketing office now, but I was also fortunate to be a student here um, when Phil and Leo were both teachers. And uh, I may be biased, and I apologize to the current faculty, but I just believe that those years were the golden years, the golden age of, of uh, writing in the creative writing program. Um, I was able to take classes from Howard Moore, um, from Bart Sutter, came back and taught for one quarter, and I took two classes from him, which was just so great. Um, I took classes from Bill. We were just, Kathy and, and Betsy and I were reminiscing about my freshman year, winter quarter making dumplings with Marcy and Bill. 
what an experience we had. It was so great. Um, so my first uh, poem that I want to read, I'm doing mine out of order from what you see on your program. I wanted to read um, my poem from Phil. And this is a book. I went to see Phil last year, uh, spend the morning with him so Alexa could go out and kind of take care of some things for herself. So I spent the morning with him, and it was amazing. I ran to Eileen at the Lunds when we were having coffee, and it was such an amazing morning because he was still teaching. And um, this is reading while driving, which I think is the modern, or it's equivalent to the modern version of texting and driving. So imagine, totally dangerous. We tell kids not to do it. But here he is talking about, and I know Bill did this too. I, I think I was in the car with him, reading stuff. You're thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to die. But they did it all the time. So reading while driving, it also means a little bit to me because um, some poems that I shared with Phil last spring were related to haiku, but writing them so that they would fit into the space for Twitter, which he just thought was just, this is so crazy, but he was so entertained by this idea, and it was just a lot of fun to share that poetry with him. So this is Reading While Driving. I drive and dive for a few words, then surface to the road, holding them in my ear until I see all is clear, and dive again. I'm a danger to myself, other cars, the piecemeal poem, though maybe like any modern, I love fragments. This phrase, all that was left on the stone after the crash of a civilization. Read into it, everything, a history of someone at the helm who wasn't there, who was dreaming, and repeat the ritual of its few syllables, the best way to face your futures, the one oncoming, the other crowding fast from behind. Uh, for my, my Leo part, I've got, I've got a show and tell. This is so great. Um, when I was a student from 89 to 93, it was a great time, but at the end was the big celebration that you were talking about, Pat and Jan, both mentioned this evening. And as I was going through my Hogs and Personals, this was a textbook in my rural lit class with Bill Holm. He liked to call the class, pardon my language, cow shit lit. If you remember that, that's what he called the class because it was about rural literature. So this was a textbook in that class. And I used this for my portion um, reading at Leo's celebration. I was a senior and I was asked to read along with one other student and it was such an honor. But what I found in the book is such a treasure. It's the lineup from the evening. Eileen Thomas mentioned, if you'd like to see this afterwards, you can come and take a look at it. It's such a treasure. And then I have the program. These are all just tucked in this book. I had no idea they were here. The program from the evening, everybody who read. And here's another great treasure. Is, Pat, you mentioned having a musical piece. Upside down. <laughs> yes, I had all the music. I'm not even sure why I had this, because I didn't sing. But I have it, and it's so great. So that was good fun to find that and just think about that evening. It was May 13th, 1993. I graduated two weeks later and started working at SMSU about a month later. And I'm still here because it's so great. I love it so much. So I'm going to read the poem that I read for Leo's celebration that night. And it's called Farming Words. Mark, I am so sorry I got this first, but it had to be mine. It was destined. <laughs> Farming Words. Once a farmer painted the word cow on the sides of all his cows so that deer hunters would not mistake them for deer. Then he discovered when he looked out over the pasture, if he closed his eyes halfway and squinted just right, he could make the cows disappear and he saw only the words. The farmer was delighted as he watched the words move and arrange themselves in lines reaching off into the horizon. He painted words on his other animals pig, hen, horse, sheep. Before long, he did nothing but sit on his porch all day and squint, watching his words eat and mate. <laughs> he was never any good at real farming, but this was way more fun anyway. <laughs> but one day the farmer noticed some words lying flat on the ground, dead words, 
Other words just dried up. Words ran away. It was a bad year for words. There was massive word failure. <laughs> and I'll have these things for sharing afterwards. Well, I am Mary Rademacher Harrelson, and I met Phil Dacey in the early 80s through Kathy Bond when her husband was the chair of the department, and we were writing a grant for the first hospice in Marshall. And we went to Phil. He had lost his sister to cancer, and we asked him to help us. And that was the beginning of a 30-some year friendship. And as I'm listening to everybody tonight, I think of all the different facets to Phil. I was taught by both Phil and Leo. I was so fortunate to go to, go to school here and graduate. But I chose poetry tonight that um, reflects the Phil that I knew for so many years living in the valley in Lind. I think of the huge impact he made on students' lives and the literary world and the tiny footprint he left on this earth. I think of going by his house and he would be out mowing his yard with a push mower, not an electric push mower, and he had a big yard, but a push mower that he would sharpen the blades and often he would take his phonograph put it on a chair on his porch and play classical music as he was mowing his grass. I've been at his house when he was washing his clothes in the bathtub. He just did not like all the modern conveniences. He was part of a cooking group that I belonged to for many, many years. And he would say, if you're having mashed potatoes, I'll mash them. No beater for me, I want the old masher. And he would mash the potatoes and wash the dishes, and I chose two poems that reflect his life in that valley. Death and Television. Because I chose not to own a television, death came to me before my time and stayed. A well-behaved guest and taught me ease with him. At 50, I'd bought myself a country house tucked into a valley the south side, all windows, framing hills, a horse pasture, my acreage. It had the feel of a retreat, strategic, and even showed its doorless back to the road in a gesture of privacy. Less unfriendly than simply the perfect place in which to work. Soon, however, the two primary females in my life, mother and daughter, campaigned for me to get a television bribe me even, my mother offering to pay. It's a good way to relax after work. My daughter promising more overnights. Tempted, I almost fell for a salesman bargain. Used, 50 bucks, works perfectly. But some grace saved me from my two graces. Their force, maybe already I'd seen the promise of the house or heard it myself thinking, or woods at the windows, as it were, made the flickering screen, screen seem a violation. In any case, my non-act was an act, continuous, a long no that was a longer yes, and death must be so totally no he loves yes more than anything. At least he said as much the day he showed up, friendlier than I expected him to be. TV, he said doesn't agree with me. And so I'm pleased to find this place which feels like home, if only a temporary one. I'd like to stay a while and rest. I'm in no hurry. His wish to slow down didn't bother me. I go into house after house where that box is noisily on, noisily demanding everyone's attention like a spoiled child. It distracts me to the point I can't think straight and sometimes even forget what or for whom I've come. My hosts ignore me, though all I'd like is a little talk, some intimacy, less for my own sake, actually, than theirs. 
So we knelt together in the garden, joking, as death planted only perennials, and strolled at dusk along the country road past scattered houses turning dark, except for all their alien lit squares of blue. Back home, we'd leave every switch unflipped to sit and watch the rising moon's light throw itself down in front of us across the wide carpet, an opera singer singing Dido on the shore, all grief and abandonment. We'd sit there, Death and I, savoring those moments and listen to the radio, that verity that blends so well with night, its music, late news, its strong, clear signals. And the second poem I want to read is Lama Days. And I know this happened. Because today I walked a llama back home, I have a new standard for all my coming days. Just minutes with the llama made this one a poem of kindly wonders, long-necked, woolly praise. I've been raking leaves, bent forward, head down, eyes on my country acre so that when I raised them and saw at dry driveway's end a llama standing tall there, checking me out, I was all stammer and gawk and disbelief until I thought of Leon, my neighbor half a mile away, whose land was mostly zoo, menagerie, whatever. I called him Doolittle, the animal doctor himself. Though Leon was no vet, just one big heart for anything that walked on paw, web, or hoof. Goat, peacock, sheep, horse, donkey, mink, hare, heart. But llama? I'd never noticed one before, though no doubt my surprise at seeing him was matched by his at seeing me, or more than matched, he being lost, freedom become a burden twice as bad as any bars. So much so, panic struck and he turned back, high-stepping it onto the road, two lane, tarred, and I saw the headline, Llama Killed by Truck. Dropping the rake, I raced to rescue him, who now stood frozen, straddling the center line, looking this way and that. Oh, too much room, too little clue. I had to herd him back to Leon. With slow approach and arms of traffic cops, I eased him into action in the lane, leading to Llama Chow, and fell into step beside him, well, sort of his two to my one. I talked him down the road, an unbroken string of chatter, my invisible halter and rein. How you doing? Where'd you think you were going? A little farther now, big guy. You'll be just fine. Luckily, no car came to make him bolt, though I almost wished for one, wanting someone to see us like old friends out for a stroll, shoulder to shoulder in the morning sun. Once we got close enough to what he knew, he was gone down the right driveway this time, and I was left alone to wave goodbye. You take care now. His thanks silent. You're welcome. I don't expect the llama to escape again. Leon repaired a fence, no doubt, or gate. So I know tomorrow I'll have to find my own, invent one, a facsimile, and I can't wait. Already I see him coming like a dream disguised as odd events, encounters, small dramas, worth at least a laugh. Let he walked his llama home be my epitaph. I wish you lots of llamas. Thank you. How I escaped from the labyrinth. How I escaped from the labyrinth. It was easy. I kept losing my way. And for 13-year-old Dan Wall, that was, that was brilliant. It wasn't just a joke. It was a reminder that, hey, I could, it's OK to feel lost and not know what I'm doing with poetry. And, and Phil Dacey was so kind to buy me lunch and hand me a stack of, of uh, journals and tell me what a poet could expect and how to do it. I didn't know. My folks uh, lined up some poets. They said, can you come and talk to my crazy kid? Sure. So he bought me lunch. He gave me some journals. And I read this poem. And I thought, oh, I don't have to feel 
so angsty. I could, I could do this. I could do this. This other poem by Phil Dacey is called Memorizing Poems, and it has four stanzas. Uh, each one talks about a different way of thinking about memorizing poems. A man learning to juggle, a line clatters to the floor. On the walls of the cave of the mouth, the words like horses at Lesco. Blind man led by a dog, nice brain, good brain, thank you brain. Resurrect the body of the poet in the body of the poem in your body. We all know that uh, Phil spent a number of years living in New York City, and that's where this poem takes place. It was inspired by some time in New York, and Phil wrote this comment about this poem. This is from Phil. From 2004 to 2012, I lived out a post-retirement adventure by residing on Manhattan's Upper West Side. It was a glorious experience, especially when I discovered I was a short walk away from Juilliard, where for eight years I turned myself into a Juilliard junkie by attending student recitals often daily, sometimes more than once a day. Itzhak Perlman taught there, and some of the recitals I saw were performed by his students. The death, I imagine, is, of course, a comic one, but one I would seriously prefer to the other kinds of death. New York Requiem. My idea of a good death is to fall under the wheels of not the Crosstown 79th Street bus, but the motorized wheelchair of Itzhak Perlman, who lives in my neighborhood, whom I have seen countless times and who yesterday almost ran into me as I made notes for a poem while walking on Columbus Avenue, where I would be happy to die if I could do so under the weight and impact of the violinist's bulky vehicle. My final encounter, thus a musical one, appropriate after so much of my time spent attending recitals at Juilliard which someday he'll be exiting, having just seen a student of his perform, at the very moment I trip, to all appearances accidentally, in front of him as he's speeding up the sidewalk so that I can be a martyr, oh, Catholic childhood's dream of sainthood, to music, its ability to transport the listener to a new place. Well, I, I, I brought a visual aid, I brought some props, and I thought I might have the coolest visual aid tonight, but no, I concede to Marcy. Wasn't that great that she had those artifacts? Because earlier tonight, we were all trying to conjure up when was that tribute to Leo, and you've got all the evidence, so thank you for bringing that. Here are my visual aids. This is written by Leo Dangle, and it's from Leo's The Crow on the Golden Arches, which was published in 2004. It's entitled, Recasting My Father. Boys love to see some wildness in their fathers. Robert Bly. My father, who naturally lived the role of a plain, quiet farmer, mentioned that he once owned a big motorcycle, an Indian, the desired name in those days. He recalled my grandfather's lack of understanding. He couldn't see what I wanted with that thing. In his youth, my father drove horses or a Model T Ford, and I know he must have looked like a farmer 
wearing overhauls when he rode that thing, but I picture him in a black leather jacket, loaded with flashing buckles and snaps, and a motorcycle cap tilted low, the rebel outfit of Marlon Brando. My father as the wild one, roaring over the rolling hills of South Dakota's Turkey Ridge, past quiet neighborhood farms, when families sit at dinner, the sound in his wake almost rattling the plates, folks saying, there goes that fool again. Thank you. So now we're going to give uh, Phil and Leo the last word, but before that, I'd like to um, help you, encourage you to have some bars, some Minnesota bars afterwards, stay and talk, <laughs> had to be bars. And also, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, Professor David Pekaski, who published the work of Philip Dacey and Leo Dangle, and he's generously donated many books from both poets for you to take home tonight for free. So those are out um, in the lobby. So please help yourself and um, keep the poetry of these two poets alive by reading it, sharing it, and spreading them far and wide. There's also books for sale. Someone from the Barnes & Noble bookstore is here to sell some of their books as well. And so now I will do the setup here. Mm, and I'd like to acknowledge my brother, <clears throat> um, Owen. Uh, you may have seen him on TV, the uh, St. Louis traffic cop who dances as he works. Candid camera had him doing it to music. Uh, Barishnikov uh, in blue, all. Uh, big city style and jazzy moves. Uh, years before my brother was on that corner, that corner had written the book on gridlock. Nearby factories and trains and freeway, freeway entrances and exits had tied travelers and city planners in knots. A million dollar set of lights installed in place of one patrolman under siege fizzled, followed by another try at manpower. This time, three policemen strategically placed the coroner's own Bermuda Triangle. Not many problems disappeared in there. And soon, the technocrats threw up their hands and let the three, my brother, one of them, sink or swim in that sea of honking cars. They swam and sank, and swam and sank, until one fateful day, both of my brother's partners called in sick. The station chief, fed up, said, put Daisy out there by himself and see what he can do, expecting nothing, which was what he got. No jam, no backup. No cursing drivers, only autos moving slick as skaters on new ice. Sweet perpetual motion, thanks to my brother's bumps and grinds, his arms now windmill blades, now darting rapiers. He never stopped, so why should the traffic? It was as if he'd been waiting all his life for just that moment. Backstage, as it were, the old star finally ill, and the new star born. You've got to understand, his life till then, it had their problems, like too many wives. I always forget that fourth one's name. But now, he'd come into his own local celebrity. TV channels featured him as the evening's good news. And soon, not so local. A California film crew documented him in Pop Cop, you can see it on YouTube, and folks from near and far made him the victim of his own success by driving there to watch free entertainment, thus creating more traffic, which he handled with his usual purposeful show, and sometimes with a move it buddy Sometimes he made them go away. 
They did not want to flow, go, but they did flow, did flow. Businesses threw banquets for him, and more than one driver's left hand shot out to pat him on the back. Good job there, Dace. And though art meant for him, Glenn Miller, period, to see him work, you'd think there had to be a muse of traffic cops. But what he did was more dangerous than art, as brave bullfighters were close to the horns, my brother worked close to the cars and twice was knocked flying into the hospital. Flowers from stranded drivers filled his room. And when he returned, their horns blared welcome his entire rush hour shift. The rock was back. Mid-channel, the river swirling happily and noisily around him. When he retired, they redesigned the streets. I like to think that since my brother didn't have some athlete's numbered jersey to hang up in shrine, for him, they hung up several city blocks. The Woman at the Dig. Tired from running a combine all day through acres of wheat, Alone in front of the TV, I pay attention because the show is about scientists digging up an ancient site. I have no special interest in bones, pottery, spearheads, or prehistoric garbage dumps, and I always look past the man describing the animal migrations, burial rites, or building design, and try to catch a glimpse of the women working at the site. One of them might be wearing cut-off jeans and a halter top, clearing a patch of ground with a trowel or a brush. These women are all experts. You can tell by the way they look at a bone chip or pottery shard. They understand worlds about the person who left it. Sifting soil, they show more grace than contestants in a Miss Universe pageant. Years from now, when these farms are ancient history, an expedition with such a woman might come along. I could drop something for her to find. A pocket knife, a brass overalls button. If only she could discover my bones. My eyes would be long gone, but I can see her form coming into focus above me as she gently sweeps aside the last particles of dust. Her knee, thigh, hip, shoulders, and finally set off by sky and spikes of sunlight, her face, a woman who recognizes what she's found. I'm just gonna say thank you all for coming and uh, go eat, eat, eat stuff and talk to each other. That's probably the best thing we can do right now. Thank you. Thank you.